All right, members of the jury, good afternoon. Please be seated. I hope everyone enjoyed their lunches. The state has uh, some additional witnesses this afternoon, and the first witness who will testify this afternoon, the state will seek to admit um, that um, or submit that witness as an expert. So I just want to give you a charge. I know you've heard this before in my opening comments, but it seemed like an opportune time to reread that charge to you. It's not overly long on expert testimony. And this applies not only to the next witness, but perhaps another witness this afternoon and then um, likely witnesses next week. <clears throat> so as a general rule, ladies and gentlemen, witnesses can testify only as to facts known by them. <clears throat> this rule ordinarily does not permit the opinion of a witness to be received as evidence. However, an exception to this rule exists in the case of an expert witness who may give his or her opinion as to any matter in which he or she is versed and which is material to the case. <clears throat> in legal terminology, an expert witness is a witness who has some special knowledge, skill, experience, or training that is not possessed by the ordinary juror and who thus may be able to provide assistance to the jury in understanding the evidence presented and determine the facts in the case. In this case, expert witnesses may be called by the state and defendant. And as I said, the state does intend to call uh, at least one and possibly two witnesses this afternoon who they will offer as expert witnesses. Please bear in mind that you are not bound by such experts' opinions, but you should consider each opinion and give it the weight to which you deem it is entitled whether that be great or slight, or you may reject it. In examining each opinion, you may consider the reasons given for it, if any, and you may also consider the qualifications and credibility of the expert. It is always within the special function of the jury to determine whether the facts on which the answer or testimony of an expert is based actually exist. The value or weight of the evidence, strike that, let me rephrase. The value or weight of the opinion of the expert is dependent upon and no stronger than the facts on which it is based. In other words, the probative value of the opinion will depend upon whether from all the evidence in the case you find that those facts are true. You may, in fact, determine from the evidence in this case the facts that form the basis of the opinion are true or not true, or are true in part only. And in light of such findings, you should decide what effect such determination has upon the weight to be given to the opinion of the expert. Your acceptance or rejection of the expert opinion will depend, therefore, to some extent on your findings as to the truth of the facts relied upon. The ultimate determination of whether or not the state has proven defendant's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, is to be made only by the jury. All right, with that charge, Mr. Shellhorn, can you call your witness, please? Yes, Your Honor. The state will call Detective Andreas Zaharopoulos. All right, Detective Zaharopoulos, please. Well, Detective, please remain standing. Place your left hand on the Bible. Please raise your right hand and listen to my court clerk administer the oath. Do you swear in the presence of Almighty God that the testimony given to this court regarding this matter shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Please state your name and spell your last name for the record. Andreas Zaharopoulos, Z-A-H-A-R-O-P-O-U-L-O-S. Thank you. All right, please be seated. Please keep your voice up. If you don't understand a question, detective, please indicate that, and I'll have counsel rephrase. Yes, sir. Mr. Shellhorn. You have some photographs you want to um, address that's, first? That's right, Judge. The photos are marked as S261 through S269. I don't believe there's any objection to the admission of those into evidence, as well as S340 and S341. That's correct, Judge. I have no objection.
by those photographs will be accepted into evidence by the court and can be displayed to the jury during the detective's testimony. And for the record, those are States Exhibit 261 to 269, States Exhibit 340 and 341, all entered into evidence. Please proceed, Mr. Shopman. Thank you, Your Honor. Detective, can you please reintroduce yourself to the jury and tell them where you work? My name is uh, Detective Andreas Zaharopoulos, and I currently work for the Morris County Sheriff's Office. What is your current rank and assignment? I am a detective uh, in the Crime Scene Investigation Unit. Approximately how long have you been assigned to that unit? Approximately six years. Have you ever held any other positions or assignments with the Sheriff's Office? Yes. What was that? Uh, when I first was hired, I was assigned to the Protective Services Unit, which is here in the courthouse. I'm going to ask you some questions about your qualifications. Uh, can you tell the jury about your level of education? Uh, I have a bachelor's degree from the University of Rutgers. And do you have any specialized tra training with regard to crime scene investigation? Yes. What was that? Uh, when I was first assigned to the crime scene unit, I attended the state police uh, crime scene school, which is approximately six weeks. And after that, I with throughout the years, I've attended numerous courses. Do you have any specialized training with respect to shooting analysis and reconstruction? Yes. Can you give the jury a summary of that training? Uh, I've taken basic uh, shooting reconstruction as well as advanced shooting reconstruction, so approximately 120 hours of training solely on shooting analysis and reconstruction. Have you ever instructed uh, any courses with respect to crime scene or crime scene investigation? Yes. Have you ever investigated any shooting incidents during the course of your career as a detective? Yes. Can you tell the jury approximately how many shooting incidents you've investigated? I have been to approximately 60 uh, different shooting incidents, 30 of which I have investigated. Meaning that you were the primary investigator? Correct. <clears throat> Can you tell the jury when you say uh, shooting incidents, what type of incidents that would uh, include? I've responded to anything from accidental discharges to suicides, uh, attempted homicides, homicides, uh, with, uh, with accidental discharges being uh, law enforcement or of uh, people inside their own homes. Uh, can you define the term shooting reconstruction? What does that mean? It's an analysis of a shooting scene. And what are you attempting to do in that analysis? We determine through uh, evidence at a scene, we determine to try to find from where a projectile uh, was fired from. What's a projectile to the, the common person? A bullet. Are there any principles you follow in conducting a shooting reconstruction? We use sci the scientific methods, mathematics, physics, to try and determine uh, a path of a projectile. Are there limits on what you can determine? Yes. Judge, at this point I would like to offer Detective Zaharopoulos as an expert in the field of shooting reconstruction. All right. Counsel, do you have any questions as to the qualifications? No, Judge. All right. Do you have any objection to Detective Zaharopoulos being qualified as an expert in shooting reconstruction? No, Judge. All right, very well. I've listened to the qualifications of the detective, and I do find pursuant to Rule 702 that he is an expert witness in the area of shooting reconstruction based on his education and training, as well as uh, experience in investigating uh, 60 shooting incidents and 30 as the primary investigator. So he is qualified as an expert and will be allowed to render his opinion pursuant to Rule 702 of the New Jersey Rules of Evidence. Go ahead, Mr. Shellhorn. Thank you, Your Honor. Detective, when you respond to a shooting incident to undertake a shooting reconstruction, what type of evidence do you begin by looking for? Uh, we look to see if there's anything potentially uh, casings that we might find, defects, uh, whether it be into a window, uh, a car, uh, a door, a house, uh, anything like that where we can find uh, any type of defect. Does the surface or material that's involved with the defect have any impact on your reconstruction? Yes. Can you explain that? Well, each surface responds differently to force. Uh, if you have, uh, I would expect that a projectile would perforate a drywall. Uh, I wouldn't expect it to go through brick. 
Uh, glass is another thing that a uh, projectile could go through. Are there any particular tools that you use in conducting your reconstruction? Yes. Can you tell the jury what some of the tools are? Uh, typically, uh, in shooting reconstruction, we utilize flight path rods, uh, angle finders, protractors, lasers. What's a flight path rod? It's approximately 18 inches in length. It's a rod uh, made out of either fiberglass or metal that we use to put through or into a defect to determine the flight path or the angle of a projectile. And uh, for those people who may not remember what a protractor is from elementary school, can you remind us? It's a, angle, uh, it's a measuring instrument used to measure angles. Now I want to draw your attention back to August 7th of 2019. Were you working for the Sheriff's Office on that day? Yes. Were you working in your capacity as a crime scene investigation unit detective? Yes. Do you remember what shift you were working that day? I believe I was working the morning shift. Would that, and would that continue through into the afternoon? Correct, eight to four. Now, how does, uh, in general, CSI typically become involved in an investigation? We are a supporting agency. We support uh, and respond to any municipality within Morris County or the prosecutor's office if they require our assistance for a particular uh, crime scene. Is the only thing you do with, as a member of CSI, shooting reconstruction, or do you undertake other aspects of crime scene investigation? I have other assignments within the unit. Now, specifically on August 7th of 2019, do you recall if you were made aware of a shooting incident at 411 West Mill Road in Washington Township? Yes. Did you go to that address? I did. Do you remember approximately what time you arrived? I believe somewhere around 3 o'clock, possibly at, just after 3. Were there other members of CSI present at various times during that investigation? Yes. What was your assignment or responsibility with respect to this investigation? Uh, my assignment was to conduct the shooting reconstruction as well as to utilize a video camera and document uh, the scene. How was that role or responsibility determined? Uh, through our supervisors and the different officers on scene, we discuss, we get together, who was going to do what task. Do you recall what the weather was like that afternoon? Uh, on my approach to the scene, uh, I was transporting a, uh, our command trailer, and it was downpouring on my approach to the scene. Now, you mentioned uh, taking uh, video. Can you just explain that process to the jury? Uh, typically, uh, our video cameras, we place an SD card inside, and then we, uh, or I, as I approach the scene, just video uh, tape the outside of the home, and then I went inside and uh, videotaped the interior side of the house as well. Do you do that before or after taking photos? That is conducted after we take photographs. Do you do the video before or after collecting evidence? Before. What's the reason for that sequence? Uh, the purpose of videotaping is just like photography and initially. You want to document the scene as is without disturbing anything. Did you actually take a video in this case? Yes. And after you did that, did you then turn your attention to the uh, shooting reconstruction? Yes. Before I ask you questions specifically about that, did you have other involvement in this case uh, on the following day, August 8th? Yes. Can you tell the jury briefly what your responsibilities were on August 8th? Uh, we were requested to respond for the prosecutor's office to photograph uh, the home as well as the barn house for any potential evidence. And while I was at the farmhouse, I utilized uh, metal detectors to look for casings or one casing that we were believed to be on scene. Did you also take some photos of the various areas you just discussed while you were there that day? Correct. So taking your attention back to August 7th, 2019, how did you begin your shooting reconstruction? I took my own camera and began <coughs> photographing uh, the primary scene of where the shooting took place with the first defect, which was the, the door. Can you remind the jury what you were looking for as initial e uh, evidence? Uh, I was instructed, well, I was advised by Detective Bailey, who was the crime scene detective for CSI, 
and locate that he had located two projectile uh, casings on the uh, paved, not paved, gravel driveway. And with that, I also uh, had it up, I observed the defect on the door. And that's how I determined a start point uh, for my um, analysis. Is your role, is your focus in conducting a reconstruction on determining who shot the gun? No. Did you observe any bullet defects in the farmhouse? In the farmhouse? Yes. yes. Can you tell the jury where you observed those defects? The first defect was uh, on the door. Then inside this laundry room area, there was a black mat that was hanging. Uh, there was about, it was a, like a ricochet or um, a graze to it. And then there was an exit defect on the window behind it. Did you take photos of all those defects? Yes. What's the process that you go through with uh, examining each separate defect? Each defect is photographed. Uh, then I looked at them one-to-one uh, -one with a uh, ruler up against it just to get the correct uh, accurate measurements of each defect. And then from there, I started using the flight path rod to determine an angle of it. Now, before we discuss the specifics of the conclusions uh, that you reached, uh, were you able to reach any conclusions with respect to those bullet defects? Yes. Well, what did you conclude? Uh, I concluded that the projectile in the defect to the door was from the outside going in, and I also determined a certain angle uh, up and down and left to right as to how it entered the, the door. Did you document those conclusions in a report? Yes. And I'm going to draw your attention to the screen. I'm going to show you what's been marked as S389 in evidence. <clears throat> Detective, what is S389 a diagram of? It's a diagram of the farmhouse. <clears throat> and is this a fair and accurate diagram based on your involvement in the investigation on August 7, 2019? Yes. You had mentioned uh, earlier that you were aware of some casings that were located. Correct. Can you tell the jury what a casing is? Uh, the casing is where from a projectile, um, when you fire a weapon, the projectile, the bullet, exits from the front of the barrel. The casing, whether it's a semi-auto or a revolver, uh, in a semi-auto, it ejects either a certain way. In a revolver, it stays within the cylinder of the weapon. So the casing is the piece that's, that's left over after the bullet is Correct. Fired. And do you see the uh, approximate location where those casings were found on this diagram, S389? Yes. Can you tell the jury where those are? Uh, they are the square, yellow squares, uh, in front of the uh, red pickup truck. And they're labeled as MCSO item number 9 and MCSO item number 8? Correct. And does that diagram fairly and accurately <laughs> depict the area where those casings were when you were there on that day? I believe so, yes. Where was the first defect that you indicated that you observed on the farmhouse? It was on the door by the patio. And uh, where is the door on S389? Uh, to the bottom right of the house. All right, I'm going to ask you to uh, look at S261. What's S261 a picture of? It is the <coughs> photo of the door. And um, where was the defect on the door? It is uh, to the right middle glass pane. So to the right of that, uh, the pane to the right of that piece of paper Cor that says notice on Correct. it? Correct. What was the condition of the glass on the door? It had shattered. What is S262 a picture of? It's a close-up of the same window. And what is S263 a picture of? It's a close-up of the defect. And is this picture taken on the exterior of the door? Exterior, yes. 
Was there any difference in the glass on the exterior or outside of the door from the glass on the interior or the inside of the door? There was a difference. Can you explain to the jury what the difference was? Uh, in a shooting, especially when it comes to glass, you can determine uh, the entrance and exit of a defect. Uh, the back side or the exit side of a defect produces a cone shaped or a crater when the, the force of the projectile striking the glass forces the uh, glass on the inside to basically shatter outwards, causing that crater, and it has a rough surface. And did that help you determine the entrance and exit sides of the, the window? Yes. What is X S264 a picture of? It's a photograph of the interior laundry room. And do you see the bullet defect that you were just discussing in this picture, but from the inside now? Correct. Can you describe where it is for the jury? It's to the left now of the uh, door on the left side of the window. So between that <clears throat> pink striped uh, piece of fabric and the p piece of paper hanging in the middle of the door? Correct. <clears throat> were there any other bullet defects that you observed or located inside this room? There was one, uh, well, it was like a scrape or, uh, on the matting, and then the exit, which is on the window, uh, to the left. Judge, I don't anticipate having to ask the detective to get up and down, but just so we can make clear where it's hard to see on this picture where the second defect is, if you could just get down and point it out on the two screens. Sure. We're giving up on the laser pointer? <laughs> I gave up on it, Judge. We gave it a week. No, you can walk over there, detective. Detective, if I could ask you if you could first point out where the bullet defect is in the door. Okay. And then if you could next point out the approximate area where the defect is on that mat. Uh, I believe somewhere, I forget where, but it was somewhere along this area. And can you see the defect you referred to as uh, the third defect in this picture? Right up here. Judge, I think everyone in the what? gallery... Everybody see that? All right. Everyone see it? All right. Very good. Everyone's nodding their heads. You only have to do it once. Thank you. <laughs> Detective, what's S-265 a picture of? That is from the interior side of uh, the door window. An S-266? It's a close-up of, uh, of the defect. Detective, is there any significance to the pattern in the glass uh, around the defect? Uh, this uh, breaking of the glass has different fracturing, and you have uh, radial, concentric, and concordial fracturing. And what does that uh, tell you? The first type of Fractures you get in a shooting scene of glass is radial fractures. Those are, if you see from where the opening is or the defect itself, how the lines radiating outwards, uh, linear, like straight out, those are the <clears throat> radial fractures. They are the first fractures that occur when a projectile strikes uh, glass. What about the other uh, types of fractures? The other fractures that you see basically going in almost circular around it are the concentric uh, fracturing, and then just where the uh, defect is broken right there is the concordial fracture or the beveling. And is there any significance to those fractures? Uh, the concentric is just, they occur after the uh, radial fracturing, and then the concordial is uh, the smoothest or the, how the, it bevels. Now, what is the material to the left of the glass in this picture? That was uh, the vinyl wood combination of the paneling of the door. And it appears to be broken in this picture? Correct. Were you able to determine, or did that have any significance to your reconstruction? Yes. Can you explain that to the jury? Uh, in this situation, because the size of the defect, you couldn't have the a perfect angle with the flight path rod to stay in place. 
With, however, with the correlation of the other defects, I was able to get uh, the flight path of the defect. So if you only had this bullet defect by itself, would you have been able to determine a flight path? No. All right, directing your attention back to S264, you indicated there was a defect on that black matting? Yes. And what is S267 a picture of? That's the ricochet of the defect as it passed through. And can you identify it in this picture by the location it is on the picture as well as if there's anything to uh, identify the general area? Uh, if you see right in the middle of the photo, there's uh, the threading is slightly disturbed. And is it discolored in any way in that area? Uh, it's a little bit white. I'm going to show you another angle of that defect. Is that a picture? Of, is that picture labeled as S268? Yes. Can you identify in S268 where the bullet defect is? Right there in the middle of the matting, where you see the thread sticking out slightly. What is that in the background of the picture that's somewhat blurry? That is the exit defect. And that was the window on the other side of the room? Correct. Now I'm showing you what's been marked as S264 again. Uh, did you take some close-up photos of the third defect on the, the left-hand side? Yes. What is S269 a picture of? That is the exit defect on the inside of the laundry room. And can you tell the jury anything about the nature of this defect? With that, you can see to the top left of your screen, you have the radial fracturing, and then you have the concordial fracturing. When you were back at the scene on uh, August 8th of 2019, you said that you took additional photographs? Correct. Is S340 a picture you took the following day? Yes. And do you see the uh, area where the bullet defect we just looked at in the last picture is, is shown in this picture? Yes. Where is it? Uh, if you look on the bottom where the uh, AC unit is, right above it to the top left uh, window pane. And is S341 a closer up picture of that window? Yes. Detective, I'm drawing your attention back now to S-264. Can you describe for the jury the process that you did with the flight path rod using S-264 to assist you? So because of the, the glass that had fractured, uh, I was able to get an area convergence of the glass, basically following those lines back to where the defect entered. And from that moment, that was where I placed the rod. With the rod, I had used uh, lasers to line up with the exit defect to get uh, the flight path of the projectile. So are you indicating that you had one flight path rod in the door and another one on the defect in the window? No, just one was used. And you were able to line it up with the laser? Correct. And did the laser, what did the laser show you? The, the laser uh, showed me the uh, flight path of the projectile going back as well as going forward outside of the residence. And as far as inside the residence here in S-264, did that bullet defect in the door match the same flight path as the bullet defect in the window? All three defects correlated with each other. Were you able to render opinions then based on the flight path of the projectile based on your observations at the scene as well as your shooting reconstruction? Yes. I'm showing you what's been marked as S390. What is S390 a diagram of? That is a diagram of the flight path of the projectile. And this is an overhead uh, diagram of the flight path? Yes. Can you tell the jury where that uh, flight path is in this picture? It is between where the first uh, target defect was on the door and the front of the red pickup truck. Was that bullet mm -hmm. defect uh, at some sort of an upward or downward angle? That was on an upward angle. Meaning that which end uh, of this line on S390 would be lower? 
The front of the pickup truck. And the end where it goes into the house is higher? Correct. And so what does that mean for where the, the barrel of the gun was at the time that the gun was shot? In response to the shooting analysis, the front of the barrel was right where the near, approximately where the front of the pickup truck was. That it started at the front of the pickup truck? Correct. That you're saying that's where the gun was at the time it was fired? The front of the muzzle, yes. The muzzle of the gun was at the base of the pickup well, truck? Well, the trajectory fired. of the flight path. Somewhere in between the front of the pickup truck and the door. Are you able to give any opinion on the height of the muzzle of the gun when it was fired? No. And why is that? Uh, we didn't have uh, height or distance determination of any uh, uh, of anything to determine that. So I guess does that mean there were certain factors that you didn't know in this case to be able to assist you with that? Correct. Are you able to determine whether those shell casings that you discussed at the beginning are consistent with uh, or connected to this bullet defect that you, you discussed? No. Why not? Uh, because with the casings, you can't determine what type of ammunition was fired into a, what created the defect. Are all your opinions that you provided today within a reasonable degree of practical certainty? Yes. Judge, if I could just have the detective get down and just point to specifically what line. I don't think the color is necessarily exact there. That will be all right. <clears throat> That's fine. So, detective, if you could just point out the, the line that you were indicating was the flight path you determined based on the bullet defects. It would be between the door and the front of the pickup. And that was at an upward angle from the direction of the truck into the house? Correct. Thank you, Judge. No further questions. Fine. Qu yes. Cross examination. Detective, uh, how many shell casings uh, were found at the scene? Two shell casings were recovered. Discussion with anyone prior to your uh, analysis as to how many shots uh, were allegedly fired. I was instruct. I was advised that the victim had been shot twice, and then the third one to the door. Now, the casings that are depicted on that diagram. You'll agree with me that there's really nothing you can tell with regard to their positioning with regards to where the shots were fired. Correct. Because the casings could be disturbed prior to your arrival. Correct. Uh, were you advised that there were 40, 50 people uh, at the crime scene prior to your arrival? I don't know the number, but I was I knew that there were, had been many people within the crime scene prior to my arrival. Now, did you look for that third casing? Yes. No doubt when a bullet is fired that a casing goes along with it, correct? Correct. Uh, but in this particular instance, uh, you or any other uh, law enforcement person was not able to find that third casing, correct? We were not. Now, with regards to your analysis, when a bullet hits an object, The effect that that object has on, on the bullet varies with the type of sus substance it strikes, correct? Correct. 
in this particular instance, um, the bullet struck numerous different types of substances, correct? Correct. Um, wood, one. Vinyl. Correct. Um, and, and, and glass, correct? Yes. And, and would you agree with me that uh, depending on the strength of those particular uh, items, it affects the flight path of the bullet as it proceeds through the object? It can, yes. And, and, and again, um, your reconstruction um, based on uh, the rods that you used indicated that the shot was fired uh, from a position lower than the door, correct? Correct. Uh, and, and, and it was traveling uh, in an upward uh, angle uh, as it went through the door through the second window in that laundry room, correct? Correct. But is it fair to say that you can't term, determine the exact flight path or the exact location where a bullet was fired from? based on your analysis? Well, it's an approximate location based on where um, the back extrapolation of it was. Understood. But for instance, with, with regards to this diagram, that bullet could, could have been fired from the front of the vehicle, correct? Correct. It could have been fired from uh, the patio area here, correct? Correct. It could even be fired right here in front of the bush, correct? Anywhere within that line, correct. And, and even when, if someone was on their back uh, firing the weapon, you can't determine the level at which the bullet was fired, correct? In this situation, we couldn't determine the height. So if someone was on the ground, and fired the weapon, that would be consistent with your analysis, correct? It would have had to been closer to the truck. Correct. And again, you indicated that although you have an analysis regarding this flight path, it's an estimate and it could vary by a foot or so depending on where the person was either standing or on the ground when they fired, correct? A small degree of error, but yes. Depending on the surface that a bullet strikes, depends depends on how far the bullet is projected further, correct? Can you repeat that? If a bullet doesn't strike anything, it goes a certain distance, correct? Correct. And, and if it does strike something, depending on what it strikes, that lessens the distance because it goes through a particular type of, of substance, correct? I can't determine the force of if that actually has happened in this situation, but I would assume it, when it strikes an object, some force is lowered from striking an object and continuing. But in this particular instance, you have a bullet that travels a certain distance, goes through a window, wood, vinyl, breaks up against the mat, and then continues through another piece of glass, correct? Correct. Were, were you told that Lauren Cataract was shot twice, and both those bullets exited out of the back of her body? At the time, I did not know uh, if the bullets had exited her body or were inside her body. Okay. Um, well, if they did exit their, her body... Correct. They, they would travel uh, a certain distance based on what, if anything, it hit as going as it went through her body, correct? Correct. Okay. I have nothing further. Thank you. <coughs> Judge, just to clarify that flight path, if I could. Go ahead. Detective, when you're talking about the front, the flight path from the front of the truck there, is that the approximate area where you're saying that the 
gun barrel could have originated the, sh the bullet shot? Correct. And so that would have been on the ground, for instance, here, if this was under the truck? Correct. And then you're indicating that along that flight path, it goes at an upward angle into the door? Yes. So would it be something like what I'm doing right now with my pen, the gun would be somewhere along this flight path going up into the side of the, the house? Correct. And again, for, for the record, I think the demonstration is a little bit much taller than well, it's up to the jury to determine. That's what's relevant here. Did I do that the precise angle that you measured, Detective? It was, a, I believe, a 14-degree angle. Did you determine that with the protractor? Well, hold on. What was a 14-degree angle? The angle of the upward. This one? Yes. On the screen? Correct. Not what Mr. Shellhorn did? No, no, no. Okay. No, on the right, just, just so we're clear. All right. It's 14-degree angle on the screen. Very good. Thank you, Detective. Detective, Judge, could, thank you. could someone have been standing on the deck of that front porch and, and been struggling and shot the bullet at that angle and, and created the defects that you testified to? Again, if it was at a 40 degree angle and I couldn't determine the height determination. Nothing further. All right, you may step down. Thank you. Thank you very much, Detective. Thank you, sir. Who are your next witness, Mr. Shellhorn, please? I'll defer to Mr. Bennett, Your Honor. Your Honor, State Falls William Sit, please. All right, William Stitt. Uh, left hand on the Bible, please. Raise your right hand. Please listen to my court clerk. Do you swear in the presence of Almighty God that the testimony he gives to this court regarding this matter shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please state your name and spell your last name for the record. Sure. My name is William Stitt. Last name is S-T-I-T-T. -T. Thank you. I'm good to have a seat, sir. Please keep your voice up nice and loud so everyone can hear you. We yes, do sir. have jurors in the first two rows. If you don't understand the question, please indicate that. I'll have counsel rephrase. Yes, sir. Go ahead, Prosecutor. Thank you, Judge. Good afternoon, Mr. Stitt. How are you? Good morning. Uh, where are your current employees, sir? Uh, currently, I'm contracted with the Morris County Sheriff's Office. And what position do you hold in the Sheriff's Office? Uh, forensic examiner. Um, and how long have you been in the present role of uh, forensic examiner? Uh, approximately four years. And can you generally explain your duties um, as a forensic examiner within the Sheriff's Office? Sure, I'm in charge of the um, firearms identification unit, uh, both casework as well as training. And uh, what specific training and experience have you had prior to your work as a forensic examiner? <coughs> prior to? I'm sorry, could you repeat, repeat the, question? the question, prosecutor, please? Sure, Judge. What training experience did you have prior to your work as a forensic examiner, your work experience in general? Okay. Um, I was... Uh, Trained in uh, firearms examiner, um, firearms instructor. Uh, I attended two uh, basic uh, ballistics courses, one in Fort Dix, the other was hosted by the uh, Jersey City Police Department. Uh, I also attended the serial number restoration course um, put on by the ATF. I attended a techniques and firearms identification with the FBI down in Quantico. Um, several armors courses with all the big manufacturers, Glock, Smith & Wesson, H&K, Six Hour, Ruger, Remington. Um, also a trained as a Niven tech. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. As a a Niven technician. Right. Can you explain that, please? Sure. Um, Niven is a National Integrated Ballistics Information Network. Uh, they oversee Ivan, IBIS, sorry which is the Integrated Ballistics Identification System. Basically, it's a database. Um, what they do is they take digital images, download them into the database, um, and they can um, cross-check different cases. What it does for us is it can um, 
relate cases that otherwise wouldn't be. So if we have a, a casing that's recovered up here, we put it into the system. If the gun was used in a different crime in a different county, different state, what it can do is it can match that for us. And prior to your work as a contractor of the Sheriff's Office, were you previously a member of law enforcement? Yes, sir. And can you describe your longevity um, in that sense? Sure. Before that, I was um, employed by the Morris County Sheriff's Office. I retired from the Morris County Sheriff's Office. I started in um, our corrections. And I transferred to what we call the Bureau of Law Enforcement. Worked here in courts and transportation. Um, did that for about two years. Then I transferred to our um, criminal identification section, which included our crime lab and our crime scene unit. And how long were you in that role before retiring? Um, approximately 19 years. Altogether, I'm sorry. Altogether, sir, or? Altogether. Yeah. Altogether, 25 years. And what's your highest level of education? Uh, master's. During the course of your career, how many firearms have you examined? I would say probably thousands between department weapons and um, casework. And how many of those examinations were with regard to operability? Probably, again, over a thousand. Um, are you an active member of any professional organizations other than those you listed earlier? Yes. And what are those? Uh, one is the New Jersey uh, Forensics Firearms Examiners Association, uh, AFTI, which is the Association for uh, Toolmark and Firearms Examiners, and also the um, International Law Enforcement Firearms Instructors. Um, and have you been previously qualified as an expert in firearms operability in the state of New Jersey? Yes, sir. Judge, does thing moves to have William Stitt declared an expert in the field of operation of firearms and examinations? Mr. Belenkis, do you have any questions relating to this witness's qualifications only at this point? No. Do you have any objection to uh, Mr. Stitt being qualified as an expert in firearms examination? No. Right. Have you previously testified as an expert in any courts in the state of New Jersey as an expert? Yes, sir. All right. In what courts, sir? Um, I did five times. Four of them were here in Superior Court, and one was municipal. All right. Very good. Under the circumstances, I will qualify Mr. Stitt as an expert in firearms examination based on his um, knowledge, skill, and experience, and training as outlined. And we will be allowed to render an expert opinion in the area of firearms identification. Go ahead, Prosecutor. <clears throat> Mr. State, can you explain to the jury um, what it means for a firearm to be operable? Uh, that is, goes bang, basically. And when does it go bang, specifically? Um, after, well, specifically, sure. It's um, after the... Uh, Trigger is pressed to the rear, um, discharging the weapon. And can you generally give an over, uh, overview of a general cycle of operation of a firearm? <coughs> for semi-automatic? Sure. Each one was a little different. For uh, semi-automatic, sure. Uh, the first would be a feed, load, lock, fire, and unlock. Um, and now... Based on your last response, I could assume that there are different types of firearms? Yes, sir. And can you explain the difference between a revolver versus a pistol? Sure. Both of them are handguns. Um, Semi-automatic we semi weapons or pistols work a little different than um, revolvers. The, the big difference would be for the semi-automatic uh, pistols. It would be loaded with a magazine, um, whereas the uh, revolver would be loaded through a cylinder. And can you explain what the term action means uh, with regards to firearms? I'm not sure what you mean, sir. Um, specifically a double action, single action, can you explain okay. what those mean and what the differences are? Sure. If a weapon is single action or double action, single action would be just one action per press of the trigger. So if the hammer would be back, the single um, action would be pressing the trigger would release the hammer or the firing pin. Uh, double action, it would be two actions. So basically that press of the trigger, it would cock the weapon and release the firing pin. So just to clarify, with a single action firearm, the shooter would have to manually re-cock that hammer? 
Yes. Is that accurate? And then pull the trigger to release the hammer. Yes. And these two type of actions can be present in revolvers, correct? There's single action revolvers and double action revolvers? Correct. Um, can you explain the process of loading rounds into a revolver? Uh, and before you do, is there a more technical term for rounds that you would use? Uh, cartridges. Okay. Um, and, and would you say it's fair to say that a cartridge is commonly referred to in the public as a, a, roll, a round or a bullet? Yes. Okay. Um, so can you explain the process of loading cartridges into a revolver? Uh, depends on the revolver. Um, typically we see two types. One revolver would have to be, um, the cylinder would have to be released, so you would hit the cylinder release. The cylinder would actually slide out, and then what you do is you'd manually, manually load the five or six rounds, whatever it might be. So typically revolvers, in your experience, are roughly five to six rounds, generally? Typically. Um, and what are the parts, moving back to a cartridge, which is the unexpelled round, correct? Correct. What are the parts of a cartridge? Can you explain this to the jury? Sure. With the cartridge, there's basically four um, parts to it. There would be the shell casing, which is basically the container that holds everything together. Um, there would be a primer, which is basically like a, um, a fuse, if you think about it. There's the powder itself, and then the projectile, or both. Moving on to um, pistols specifically, um, are they loaded in a different way than the way you explained revolvers are loaded? Yes. And how is that done? Uh, that's done through the magazine. And can you explain what a magazine is to the jury? Sure. The magazine would be the item that would hold the cartridges for the automatic, um, semi-automatic pistol. Um, and did the number of bullets that a firearm is capable of holding vary from firearm to firearm? Yes, sir. Now, giving us a broad overview, um, what's the steps of operability testing you take procedurally when you test the firearm for operability? For operability? Sure. Uh, first thing what we do is we um, take it out of evidence. Uh, we bring it back to our lab. First thing we do is photograph it overall. The reason why we photograph it is to show the condition that we received it in. Uh, then we do a, a visual inspection. Visual inspection is just to make sure everything looks okay, nothing's bent, broken, uh, the barrel's not obstructed, anything, any safety issues that might come up. Um, then after that, what we'll do is, <coughs> excuse me, we will test fire the weapon. We'll take uh, two rounds from our supply, our ammo supply, um, load that weapon, and press the trigger. Now you said you test fire these weapons using ammunition from your supply, correct? Yes, sir. Is that always the case? Yes, sir. So if a firearm is turned into your office for exam and it comes with ammunition with it, you do not use that ammunition in tests? We do not. Okay, and what's the reason for that? Uh, more our safety. Uh, we don't know if the other ammo is uh, reloads. We don't know who made them. Um, so it's more of a safety issue. Um, if they do, does come in and they're reloads, if we do comparisons, that kind of messes up for our comparisons. So we want the um, factory loaded ammo. Um, now moving specifically to the case of hand, um, sometime in 2019 were you asked to examine firearms that were collected from 411 West Mill Road in the Long Valley? Yes, sir. Um, and do you recall what firearms you were asked to review during that case? Sure. It was a uh, Ruger LC9S, which was a 9mm uh, semi-automatic pistol. There was a Colt RME 1917 revolver, a Colt Mark IV uh, Series 80 semi-automatic pistol, and another revolver was a Frontier 22 caliber. So you said there were two pistols and two revolvers? Correct. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Um, besides the firearms themselves, were any other items turned over to you for this examination? Yes, sir. And what were those items? There was um, two magazines and two spent shell cases. And did either of those magazines um, have cartridges within them? Yes, sir. And those cartridges were within the magazine when it was turned over to your office? 
Correct. Um, you have envelopes in front of you. There's one marked uh, S178. Do you see that? 170? 178. 170. Yes, sir. Um, if you need gloves, there are gloves here on the floor beside you. Um, I would ask you then remove the, uh, the magazine from the envelope. And Judge, one somebody has been entering evidence previously. Yes. Have that out of the envelope? Yes. Okay. Um, can you hold that up for the jury? <coughs> Certainly. And if you could just remove your top fingers, I'm sorry. Sure. sorry. Are there rounds within that magazine? There are. Okay. Or cartridges, rather? Yes, cartridges. Okay. Um, and is that, is the state of the magazine as you find it before you the same way that it was returned into you uh, upon your examination? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and did you, during your examination, document how many rounds were within that magazine? Yes, sir, I did. I will be showing you what's been marked as uh, S360. Is this a uh, close-up shot uh, of the magazine as it was that day and as it is before you today? Before, before we do that, Mr. Belinkus, do you have any objection to this item being marked in the evidence? I don't believe. No, was no, it? No, no Judge M. Prosecutor asked me, I told him. All right. I don't think that was previously uh, moved, but it'll be accepted into evidence. It's item S360. Thank you. And Judge, I'll also be looking to move in uh, S362, um, among others, but right now 362. No, Judge. <clears throat> have, have you spoken to Mr. Belenkis about these items <laughs> that you're going to move in? We've yeah. shown him all the pictures. Yes, all right. And no objection to these? Okay. <clears throat> Mr. Stitt, looking at what's been marked three, I'm 362, um, do you see the rounds in that picture outside of the magazine? Yes, sir. And those rounds were uh, removed by you during the examination? Correct. Okay, and how many rounds did you remove from the magazine? Seven. And again, that's how this magazine was presented to you from the Sheriff's Office as retrieved by the scene. With the rounds, that, with the rounds in inside the magazine. the magazine? Yes, sir. Correct. Um, besides the two magazines, were any other items uh, examined by your office? Besides the handguns and the shell casings? Shell casings, so that's what I'm referring to. Um, with regard to the magazines and the shell casings, can you determine if they were related to any farms that you examined? The sh magazines and shell casings? Uh, uh, separately. So can you determine based on what you see with the magazines, if they belong to any specific farm that you examined? Yes. Yes, sir. And which farm did the magazines belong to? That was the Ruger LC9. And looking specifically at the two shell casings um, that you examined, um, were those determined well, to be farm? The, I don't, did we establish he looked at two shell casings? I know, I know he said he looked at shell casings, but I'm not sure we, we established a number. So, set the foundation first, please. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Stitt, did you examine, how many shell casings did you examine during this examination? Two. Okay. Um, and before you have envelopes on your desk that have been previously moved into evidence, um, numbers 178. Second, 
Numbers S179 and 180. Yes, sir. Can you open them? Those two shell casings you have in front of you, um, the same as those you examined that day? Yes, sir. And which firearm in particular are these shell casings related to? Uh, they they uh, match the uh, Ruger LC9S. Um, now, did you alter any reports um, as a result of your examinations? Yes, sir. And before you have two sheets of paper, should be on the table, they're marked S93 and S94. Yes, sir. And do you recognize this document? I do. And what are those documents? Those are my process reports. And how do you know that? Um, it's signed by me. And does it fair, do they both fairly and accurately depict the reports that you authored on September 25th and December 15th? Yes, sir. Um, Judge, these are just marked for a day. I don't want them entered into evidence. Thank you. Um, Mr. Stitt, we'll speak specifically to the Ruger um, handgun. It should be on the floor next to you. It's been Pre marked S177, already entered into evidence. 177, sir? Yes, sir. And do you recognize that firearm? Yes, sir. Um, is that the same firearm that you examined on September 25th, 2019? Yes, sir. And did you have the opportunity to examine that particular firearm with regards to operability? Yes, sir. Do you recall the serial number of that firearm? I don't. Okay. Um, I'd ask you to refer to your report, which is marked S93, to refresh your recollection. Which I have no objection to using the serial number. I don't, I don't think there's any... Um, Objection or question that that's the gun that was recovered in this case. Um, Is there, Mr. Belinkus? No. No, no objection. Um, and during the course of your examination of that farm, did you take photographs? Yes, sir. And I'm going to show you what's been pre marked S353, 355, 356, and 357, um, which have not been offered for you. Any objection to those, Mr. Belinkus? No, Judge, can I move those into evidence at this time, please? And what are the numbers again, sir? 353, 355, 356, and 357. Sure. No objection by um, Mr. Belenkis. Those are in evidence. Mr. Stitt, I will cycle through these photos one by one. Can you explain to the jury what you see in S353? That is the Ruger LC9. Um, and is it fair to say that the state you see it in these pictures how it was presented to you for examination? Yes, sir. And looking back at S353, um, is the slide lock back in this picture? Yes, sir. And what's the significance of that? of the slide being to the rear. Correct. Um, in this case, it'd just be for safety issues. And typically when a slide is locked back, um, what does that indicate to you about a firearm? Um, either it's um, slid to the rear for safety check or when the, um, the weapon runs dry or shoots up all the ammo, 
it will or should lock to the rear. Okay. Looking at 356, the firearm is now removed from the box, correct? Yes, sir. And 355, we see a um, close above the serial number, correct? Yes, sir. Um, now looking at S357, um, could you describe each part of the gun and its function? Uh, sure, we'd start from the top. Uh, the top section is called the slide, or referred to as the slide. Uh, what you'll see towards the rear of the slide is your um, rear sights. Towards the front uh, would be your front sight. The part sticking out of the front would be your barrel. The bottom half would be the <clears throat> would be the frame. Um, towards the back, um, you see the little notch in the slide. To the rear of that would be your thumb safety. Judge, I would ask, can Mr. Stick come down and demonstrate with his hand where these parts are? Yeah, you mean pointing out on the screen? Certainly. Yes, yes sir. <clears throat> yes. <Okay. clears throat> Our slide, the rear sight, the front sight, the barrel, the bottom part would be the frame. Towards the rear, this would be your thumb safety. This section here is for your slide lock. We now have the grip, the trigger, the trigger guard, and in the grip would be your magazine lock. And moving specifically to the part you identified as the slide lock, what's the significance of that part in particular? The slide lock, again, it would be for a safety check to slide, to lock the slide to the rear, so you can do a, a visual check. Or again, when the, um, the firearm runs dry or fires all its ammunition and it's empty, that slide should lock to the rear. And looking to the trigger, it looks like there's almost two triggers in this picture. Can you explain why it looks that way? Sure, one is a trigger safety. And can you explain what that means? Sure. Um, with this back part would be your trigger. The front would be the trigger safety. In order for that trigger to go to the rear, the first part would have to be depressed into the trigger. And what's the purpose of that safety? It's a safety. It's just so you can, so the trigger cannot be pulled or depressed to the rear. Okay. Um, you can return. Okay. Thank you. Um, how do you uh, load and unload this firearm particularly? This particular one, um, with the magazine, would have to be loaded into the magazine lock. Uh, then the slide would have to be pulled to the rear. The slide would be released, and as the slide goes forward, it would load the next, next round. And after having pointed out the parts on the gun, you did mention there's a safety on this gun, aside from the trigger safety, is that correct? Yes, sir. Um, and does that have any effect on another step that may have to be taken before the gun is fired? Um, it can. If it's engaged, yes, you have to disengage the safety to fire the weapon. Um, ultimately, as a result of your examination, was this firearm deemed to be operable? Yes, sir. How many cartridges or rounds um, can this pistol hold at one time? This particular one has a seven round magazine. And how many can the weapon actually hold? It would be eight. And it would be seven in the magazine and, and one in the chamber. And you test fire this pistol? Yes, sir. Um, you testified earlier that shell casings are ejected from a firearm, correct? Correct. And that's after a <coughs> shot or a discharge? Yes. Um, with regards to empty shell casings that are ejected, is there a particular side that they usually eject from? Um, typically it's to the right, the right side of the firearm. And when you say the right, what orientation are we referring to? As the shooter. Okay. So it would be the shooter's right? Correct. Uh, on this particular handgun, which side of the, of the gun is the ejection port on? On the right side. Um, do firearms leave specific marks on shell casings when they are fired? Yes. 
And can you explain what markings are typically left by a firearm on shell casing? Sure. Typically, with the um, with semi-automatic uh, weapons, what we're looking for is several things. They'll leave um, impressions from the firing pin, from what's called the breech face, which is the part back uh, towards the rear of the slide, um, and chamber marks. So when the empty casing gets extracted from the weapon, it can scratch on the walls of the chambers and create um, unique characteristics or stria. And after your test fires, you also then have shell casings, is that correct? Correct. So are you able to then compare shell casings from your test fires to shell casings from the ones turned into you for examination? Yes, sir. And you're able to just, uh, well, can you describe the process of how those are compared? Certainly. Um, the way we do it, we take our two test fires from when we did the operability of the weapon. We'll put them on our um, comparison microscope. We will compare those looking for unique characteristics left behind from the weapon. Um, we'll do our test fires first, and then we'll use the, um, the casings that we've collected from the scene. And... Um Again, you were given what's been marked as S179 and 180 for examination? Yes. And were you able to determine whether those shell casings were fired from any particular handgun? Yes. Which gun was that? That was the, um, the Ruger LC9. Um, and during the course of your investigation, or your examination, rather, um, you took photographs? Yes, sir. And among those photographs are the ones we've seen so far? I'm sorry, sir. Among those photographs were the ones we've viewed so far? Yes, sir. And do those photographs fairly and accurately depict the photographs that you took on September 25th, 2019? Yes, sir. Judge, would I like to admit those four photographs and evidence? On the numbers again, please. Sure. 353, 356. 355 and 357. I, I thought we already moved those in. We just Before. moved them in a few moments ago. Yeah, yeah, they're in evidence. Thank you. Moving on to December 18th of 2019, um, did you conduct another examination? Yes, sir. And are the farms you examined in that? time period reflected in your report, which has been pre-marked as S-94? Yes, sir. And you can return the Ruger box to the floor. Um, if you could retrieve from those pile of boxes what's been pre-marked S-200, already in evidence? Can you open that box, please? Do you recognize the firearm? Yes, sir. Um, and is that one of the farms you examined on December 18th of 2019? Yes, sir, it is. Is it fair to say, well, <clears throat> what are the parts of that gun um, and the function of each? Is it comparable to the gun that you just explained? Yes, sir. This is a, again, it's a uh, semi-automatic pistol. And can you hold the box up for the jury so they can see which one we're referring to? Sure. And how do you load and unload this firearm? Uh, same as we discussed on the prior weapon. And was there a magazine submitted with this firearm? Yes, sir, there was. And how many uh, rounds or cartridges does that magazine hold? This one also holds seven. Did you... Okay. And were any rounds submitted within that magazine or handgun? No, sir, I believe it was empty. Okay. And did you have the opportunity to examine this firearm for operability? Yes, sir. And was the firearm ultimately determined to be operable? No, sir, it was not. What made this firearm inoperable? 
uh, during our visual inspection of it, it was uh, determined that the um, pistol was missing both the uh, firing pin and the extractor. And I know you've mentioned firing pins before. Can you explain briefly to the jury what a firing pin is and what it does? Sure. Uh, the firing firing pin is the part that makes contact with the primer. The, only, you know, the primer is kind of like the fuse. Um, the firing pin is what strikes the primer. And why won't a handgun fire without a firing pin? Because without the firing pin, nothing would be making contact with the primer. And during the course of your examination of this particular gun, uh, did you take photographs also? Yes, sir. Judge, I'd like to... Um... Mr. Bennett, you'll be a little while longer on direct. Yes, sir. Um, it's after 3 now. We'll take our afternoon recess, and then we'll pick up in about uh, at about 3.20 or so. All right. Thank you. Sir. Thanks, sir. All right. Just wait outside. Just stay down this end, all right? Sir, yes, sir. Thank you.